We're now going to do a guided meditation. Go a little bit further this time, see what happens. So, sitting down. Is there any announcements? No announcements? Okay, very good. So closing your eyes and just letting go of the world. Going to what the Buddha used to call the cave of the heart. A little place inside you can imagine the peace, happiness and freedom. Just sets the, the tone. With your eyes closed, you can imagine that you're a long way from anywhere. Sometimes people can use visualization and imagination to their advantage. Imagine that you are the Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree, freshly enlightened. All the sounds you hear of the wind, wind through the trees, it's not the sound of cars, the sound of birds, of the river Nirangela flowing close by. And you're sitting there under the shade of a tree, perfectly alone, not needing anything in this whole world, not trying to get enlightened or peaceful because it's already there. When you don't want anything, you can enjoy what you already have. You're at peace in this moment. Nothing to do, nothing to achieve. What's done has been done. Just imagine, role play. Get into the mood of someone who's totally finished their work. Nothing more to be done. No more striving. No more wanting. Peace at last. How does that feel? Sitting quietly, calmly. No more fears, no more aspirations or disappointments, nothing which is missing from your life. Everything full, perfect, done, complete, forever. A Buddha. And once you get into that mood, it starts to give you the feeling of what meditation is. A little taste, a sniff of freedom. And then you look at your body, starting from your legs. <coughs> Making sure they're still relaxed. This is just out of kindness, out of a sense of looking after your own body. If you need to move and adjust your legs, please do so. Then you move up to your butt. Moving it this way and that way until you find its optimum position. Take your time, you have all the time in the world. 
nothing more to do, no rush. Just this moment is all the time you ever have. So you look after this moment, adjusting your bodily feeling in your butt. So it's going to not need moving for the next half hour. Experiencing the sensations in your back, giving them a stretch. And then calmly, compassionately relaxing your own back. Maybe adjusting it forward, backwards, to the side, until your your back feels really comfortable. Checking your hands, however they are positioned, to make sure they feel good. Good enough so you don't need to move them. You care about your own hands. Until they're in a position where they feel content, just like they're independent beings. You look after them and they won't cause you any problem. Then you go back up the arms to your shoulders. Maybe just moving them around, relaxing, letting go of any tension, not pulling anything, not squashing anything, letting those muscles go to their natural position. It's a wanting which strains, which pulls in the direction you want, which squashes. Release all pressure, all pulling and pushing until your muscles feel just so relaxed in your shoulders. Then you move up the neck, making sure the head is well balanced. Inside the neck and the throat, any irritation is just calmed, aware, giving it peace, giving it TLC, tender loving care, until any irritation in the throat responds. You learn how to calm things down, how to take an overreaction. of your body and calming it down so it becomes peaceful and comfortable. Inflammations get reduced. Irritations get eased. And then moving the attention to your face being aware, I'm aware of all the muscles in my face. And I relax and let them be. Not screwing up my face, not tightening this, but everything loosened. Free, comfortable, at ease. Relaxing to the mind. And I feel my whole body, not by parts, but it's a unified thing, sitting here, comfortable. But I focus on that feeling of comfort until it becomes so delightful, an old feeling I remember of comfort, ease, a body at peace is a body delighted. And just being with that delight of the relaxed body, the body gets more relaxed. And the delight becomes stable. Just being with the feelings in my body, at ease, relaxed not doing anything except knowing, 
not giving things names, not taking notes, just being calm, quiet, peaceful. Just like a Buddha under a Bodhi tree. And then, and then I start to become aware of my peace on it. From one to ten, how peaceful am I? And as soon as my awareness becomes clearly aware of my peace on it, I recognize those things which make my mind more agitated. Counting minutes a time. Concerned about these things which I cannot change, which have already happened. Striving, wanting, all of that work stops me being peaceful. I think of this moment as a Buddha would think of it. Nothing to do. Nothing to achieve. Nothing to measure. Just being at peace with this moment. Not wanting anything in the whole world. And I see that my wanting, that what makes me agitated. That makes the leaf on the tree move. And I let go and let these things be. My mind just automatically becomes more and more still. Stillness. I get so relaxed, like a guitar string, which is not being pulled on either end, which is loose. Sound hits it. The sound of workmen, the sound of people in this room, the sound <coughs> of a cough. It doesn't disturb me. If the guitar string is tight, if it's under stress, these things make it reverberate. When your mind is loose, it has what we call resilience. Disturbances do not echo when you're loose with no stress. So I imagine my mind not being pulled into the future by goals and expectations. My guitar string of the mind is not being pulling something from the past, dragging it behind me. I carry no weight from the past. I strive not for the future. I'm at peace in the present. This is good enough. You feel your mind get very peaceful. And often quite naturally, you just know your breath, the breathing going in, the breathing going out, at the center of your being, the center of your life, just breath coming in and out. And all the sounds of my voice, the people outside and beyond this room, all of that is in the background. What's in the center, it's just breath coming in, breathing in peace, breathing out, let go. And 
not forcing anything. Just being like a bystander who sees the bears come in, the bears go out. Like a person would be on the beach just watching the waves come up the shore and the waves run back down again. Beyond your control, all you can do is observe and just be with the gentle rhythm of the air feeding your energy and life and the out breath taking away all the used products Breathing in peace and breathing out, let go. I'm going to be quiet for the next 10 minutes. See if you can just be and don't react or try and control the meditation. Be a passenger, an observer, not a driver. See what happens.
getting close to the end of the meditation. How is your body? How relaxed is it? And how does your mind feel? Give it a chance for some peace. Just being, not wanting anything, not fighting the world, letting it be. <coughs> when you want something more, you want things to be different. You can't be at peace with what you already have. You can't enjoy this moment when you want to be somewhere else. I'm now going to ring the gong three times. When the gong finishes sounding for the third time, it's a signal to open your eyes. So there we are. In that meditation I introduced a little technique by imagining that you are the Buddha. Where I developed learned that technique was when I went to Singapore there was a group there had a, a kindergarten school for kids. And it was about this time of the year, Waisak. They said, can you do something for the kids at Waisak? So when I went there, I thought there was four-year-olds and five-year-olds and six-year-olds. You can't tell them ghost stories like I did yesterday. You had to adapt. And so, I said, well, the Waisak is in celebration of the Buddha's birth, enlightenment and passing away. So, the Buddha's birth. According to the tradition that the Buddha, when he was born, took seven steps and said, this is my last birth. I'm the chief in this world. So all you kids, okay, pretend you're the Buddha. Slowly take the seven steps, count them, and at the end, I am the best in the world. This is my last life. And all the kids doing that. They enjoyed putting their finger up. <laughs> and when I finished that, to act out the birth of the Buddha. And then enlightenment, sitting under the Bodhi tree. So cross your legs however you can, kids, and pretend you're the Buddha. There's a big Buddha statue there. Have a look and now pretend you're the Buddha. Close your eyes. And his even three or four year old kids were sitting there so quietly, really getting in to the feeling of being a Buddha. Because I remember just as a kid, one of the things I remember, they said, imagine you're a tree in the, from primary school, swaying in the wind. And I still remember that. And it's just the children just to, to play a role is something they can very easily do to the playing the role of being a Buddha. And I was surprised how long they could sit still. Parents were too. Tell them to be still, they can't understand what they're supposed to do. But pretend, act, you're a Buddha. And they get into it. And then last of all, you're at Kusinara, under the twin sal trees, lying on your right side, 
passing away. So kids, lie on your side and pretend you are passing away. And they were really quiet for a long time there. The teachers and the parents and me were very happy. <laughs> but afterwards, they actually, no, instead of actually talking about it, they could actually get some feeling for it. And from that time, I thought, that's how actors work. And people who do act, you know, in those roles, they can almost become those characters. So using that psychology, when you start meditating, you close your eyes, get yourself comfortable, and just imagine what it must be like to be a Buddha under a Bodhi tree. And also you try and fill in the picture. It's calm, it's peaceful, you've got nothing to do in the whole world. You're not in Melbourne having to go home in busy traffic. You're not worried about dinner. You're just sitting there, totally free from any plans or worries or concerns. Nothing to do, nothing to strive for. Sitting there, a Buddha, not trying to get enlightened, not trying to improve your meditation. You've been there, you've done that, you're finished. And you really build up that picture and you get this wonderful sense of freedom. It's called a taste of freedom. A sniff of enlightenment. Contentment. Nothing missing. Nothing to fix up. Nothing to complete. All over. Wow. And so that imagination, that gets you way ahead. And then you just... From that point, you're way ahead, then you do your meditation, it's just relatively easy. You've just found a little shortcut way up on the path to enlightenment. And it works. So I like, like that little meditation. Of course, when I do that, I'm just saying it, but I'm also feeling it as well, so I get into it as well. So this is this wonderful little innovative ways of meditating. All going to the same idea of letting go of wanting and controlling, being still, being peaceful, and feeling the body and the mind really relax. And from there, once you get into delightful, peaceful states, the rest of the stuff is pretty easy, with limiters and lights and joy and stuff like that. But it's the first part, which is the important part. You get to that delightful, just relaxing here, enjoying the meditation, and then you'll go home, at the very least, having had a beautiful, relaxed day healthier, and whoever has to put up with you when you go home, your partner, they're much better. And they feel, wow, this thing actually works. You're a much easier, kinder, sensitive, less demanding individual. And that's really important. So, any comments or questions, or last questions before we finish off for today? There's another session tomorrow, and that's again the same time in the morning, the same sort of type of schedule, and hopefully maybe, was that enough meditation or not enough? You wanted to meditate more? Less questions, okay. So tomorrow the meditations will be longer, the questions shorter, and the toilet break shorter. <laughs> Okay, so and, well, one thing we can do because some of you have contact with hospitals, can we get the bedpans <laughs> so you can just sit here, and everyone's got their <laughs> everyone's got their eyes closed. So what's the big deal? <laughs> That's why some people, they always say that when they meditate, sometimes they get overly 
aware of their saliva in their throat and they ask, should I, should I swallow or should I just let it build up and dribble? <laughs> and so, you know, for most people it's not a problem, just don't bother about it, don't worry about it, and it usually dries up by itself. But if you do have a real problem, that's where we can actually hire those little machines I have in the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> while you were meditating. <laughs> and that will solve the problem of you dribbling. <laughs> and the coughing, thank you for reminding me about the coughing. But if you do have an irritation in your throat when you're meditating, please cough. And don't suppress it. Because if you suppress that irritation in your throat, it gives what we call in meditation the volcano effect. <laughs> if you don't vent the irritation and cough at the right time, you'll find the pressure builds up. And I've seen that so many times in meditation sessions. People think, I better not cough, I'll disturb everybody. So they plug it up and the pressure builds and builds and builds and when the volcano blows... <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying my best. <laughs> so, and what happens is not only do they hear it over there next door and wonder what the heck we're doing in this room, and number two, it's a very loud noise, disturbs everybody, and also, just like a real volcano, all this very unhealthy, toxic stuff get splattered around all the people in front of you and behind you to the side as well. So a little cough in time staves a volcano effect. Yes. Are the coffins? I did that yesterday for the kids. You missed the coffin. Okay, but it's recorded. Yeah, and <laughs> you can hear it. At your leisure, but don't tell the coffin joke at night time when people have to walk home in the dark <laughs> past the cemetery. <laughs> Kids love that joke. <laughs> so, any, uh, we, oh, it's time to actually to sum up now. Yeah. So, sum up. Me summing up. Well, there we go. All finished. <laughs> no. I, I, I did the announcements before you came in. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. So there's so, nothing more to announce. And now I'm going to call the following people up for your stream winning certificates. <laughs> <laughs> and so it doesn't matter. Don't ever think, oh, how did I do today? Instead, you'll find that it doesn't matter what you feel you've achieved or not achieved and how peaceful you become, you'll find this is a natural process, whether you like it or not. That for the last, I don't know how many hours, I have been brainwashing you. And that brainwashing, conditioning you, is going to work whether you like it or not. Just like advertising gets under your radar, and it gets right inside of you. And you do become more peaceful, more calm people, whether you like it or not. I'm sorry, but it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, hope you have a wonderful journey home. But I just would like to say thank you, Arjun Brahm, for the retreat today, on behalf of everyone. So I think we could do the three sadhus. Okay. Now, let's see how much power, how much oomph, how much energy you can really put into these crazy, amazing, intense sadhus. One, two, three. Sadhu! Sadhu! And the big one, Sadhu! <laughs> Always do the three he he's after the sadhu. He he he. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he, he, he. <laughs>